Hi, I'm Derek Jensen. This is Resistance Radio on the Progressive Radio Network. My guest today is Michael Dowd. He's an eco-theologian who's been traveling North America for 18 years with his science writer and climate activist wife, Connie Barlow. And they have spoken with nearly 3,000 secular and religious groups. So first off, thank you for being on the program. And Well, actually, first off, thank you for your work. And second, thank you for being on the program. Thanks, Derek. Good to be here. So you and Connie are known as evolutionary psychologists. Is that correct? What does that mean? Well, not really. No, uh, I mean, we did, we have done many, many programs on evolutionary psychology and brain science over the years. And, oh, hang on. Let me turn my phone. Sorry about that. So for many years, we did programs on evolutionary psychology and brain science. So we're both evolutionary storytellers. We tell the epic of evolution or the universe story or sometimes what's called big green history uh, as a modern day creation myth. So we're science oriented, but our focus is on sharing the inspiring, empowering aspects of the science based history of everyone and everything that that. Uh, is gained through humanity's global collective intelligence. One aspect of that is how our instincts are formulated and formed over the course of millions of years uh, and how that drives behavior in the present and uh, some of the challenges that we deal with in the present. So I'm I'm an evolutionary evangelist. I'm an eco-theologian, um, meaning for me, ecology is the heart of theology and um my main mentors really have been Thomas Berry, Joanna Macy, Dolores LaChapelle, and William Catton, uh, I would say my most significant mentors. So I, I think we talked about this when, when, we, when we spoke a couple weeks ago, that I was sitting with a friend by the ocean, and he's a wildlife biologist, and fisheries biologist actually, and uh, he said, did you know that, that shark skins are rough because that, um, well, I don't know if because is the word, but sharks, the fact that shark skins are rough allows them to swim faster, um, than if they had smooth skin. And when he asked that, I looked at him and, and said, so that's, that's so extraordinary. Do you believe in some sort of intelligent design? I mean, that's really smart. And he, he looked back at me and he said, no, not, not really. But I think there is great intelligence in time. Yes. And, uh, yeah. So, so I, I love that. Can you, can you, do you, do you have any response to that? Yeah. Well, I'm happy to. Well, because I speak in so many different kinds of religious and secular settings, um, there's a, there's a lot of confusion around intelligence. Um, because we've been stuck for 500 years with a mechanistic worldview, largely, and at least in the West, where we think of, um, most people think of God, if they think of God, as a supernatural being who resides off the planet and outside the universe. And we've had this clockwork mechanistic understanding that the universe is like a complex clock or, you know, made by this divine supernatural being. And that trivializes God. God's no longer synonymous with reality, but it also desacralizes nature. And so if we become, when we become aware of these amazing things in the living world, um, some people go immediately to, well, that just happened by chance. And other people go, well, no, that was intelligent design. And no, it's intelligent creativity. In other words, the universe itself is intelligent at all scales, at all levels. Creativity res resides within the process. So it doesn't require us thinking of an otherworldly, supernatural, intelligent designer outside but yeah, there's profound creativity. That's why I like nesting dolls. Russian nesting dolls are just such a wonderful analogy because we know for a fact, this is not debated in the scientific community, that there are nested spheres of intelligence and nested spheres of creativity. Subatomic particles within atoms, within molecules, within cells, within organisms, within planets, within galaxies, and so on. And all levels exhibit intelligence. All levels exhibit creativity. If it weren't for, you know, stars creating the material elements, the chemical elements of our bodies, you and I wouldn't be having this conversation. And, you know, oxygen and hydrogen come together, water's created. So there's creativity at all levels. And so, yeah, I, I am a, 
a stupendous bow of awe and gratitude at this creativity of this cosmos, the creativity of reality. Let's just call it reality and that we participate in that. And then when you look at the human realm, again, it becomes really fascinating when you look at the fact that our feelings as well as our thinking and our habits often have a multi-million year uh, lineage. Let's put it that way. So before we go into you and I talked before about about like what is the role of testosterone in what is it what does it serve ecologically and I want to go there eventually because I think it's really fascinating but but I want to lay some more groundwork first and I'm thinking of I just love conversations where where we try to figure out if something is happening in a forest for example then we can often presume that it's it 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 has if it has evolved within the forest over a long term, we, we, we presume that it is adaptive for the forest. Correct. So one of the things I think about quite a bit is, is, you know, I see bears all the time and one of the things bears do is kill trees. And I was asking my biologist friend about this too. And he, he was saying, so I said, what's the ecological role of bears killing trees? And for one thing, Dead trees are better habitat than live trees in forests. They're very necessary for everything. And second, where he lives is a combination uh, Doug fir tan oak forest. And Doug firs grow faster. They uh, they reproduce faster. Um, they have all sorts of advantages over the tan oak, except that bears eat them. And so what the bears do in that particular case, a very small, straightforward and not subtle example, is that um, – they help maintain a, a diverse forest, a, a mixed forest, instead of Doug Furs taking over everything. Yep, Sad yep. for that particular Doug Fur, but happy for the forest. So can you just throw out some of your favorite examples of of cool things like that, where you have the evolutionary function of some – oh, I want to throw out one more, which is there's a certain parasite that makes fish swim to the surface of the water and flash their bellies because the next – the next stage of the parasite is to be in a in a seabird. And so what they found is if that parasite's gone, the seabirds have a too difficult time eating. And it actually ends up that the parasite is the driver for the entire that entire <laughs> natural community. So do you have a few examples like that that you that you love? Yeah, well, it's interesting uh, because my focus, I mean, in the biological world, when you start when you talk to biologists, who just have a lot of examples of that kind of thing, uh, you know, ready to ready to share. It, it truly is fascinating uh, because, again, you get the profound intelligence in the systems, in the ecological systems themselves, and the interactions over millions of years of how species have interacted and and what has allowed some species of a parasite or whatever uh, or bear or trees or fungi or I mean, even when you look at the at, at how multicellular life began working in symbiotic, mutually enhancing ways with each other. Sometimes it's just really weird. Sometimes it's just like, oh, my God, how did that happen? But my work has largely focused on the human realm, human cultures, human uh, instincts, um, why we are the way we are, why we struggle with the things that we struggle with, why we're tempted by the things that we're tempted by, um, why we get addicted and why our kids and grandkids have problems with addiction. Uh, it, you know, it turns out that our instincts, this isn't exactly your question, but, but this is where I, I, I want to go right this moment. Our instincts didn't evolve to help us survive and thrive in the world that we now live in at all. This kind of dysfunctional, um, human centered, um, uh, industrial world, our instincts are profoundly mismatched for that kind of a world. Our instincts evolved to serve us in the kind of world that we were in for 97 to 99% of human history, which is small hunter-gatherer tribal groups uh, or early, early horticultural groups that were largely living in a mutually enhancing relationship with primary reality, with the living world, their material creator, sustainer, and end. And so our instincts become ever more problematic the further we re are removed from the kind of world in which our instincts evolved to serve us, to help us survive and thrive. So can um, you give some examples of that? Okay, sure. I mean, we all have cravings for sugar, salts, and fats. Well, why is that? 
Well, it's because for 99% of human history, it wasn't easy to find sugar, salts, and fats. So having a craving for those things allowed our ancestors to survive long enough to reproduce. Yet today, we're bombarded with foods that have sugar, salts, and fats, yet we still have the cravings as if they were rare. It's a mismatch. Um all of us have genes be- that allow us to store energy because, you know, for most of human history, unless you lived at the equator, you would have to go through periodic droughts, famine, um, times when food was much scarcer. And so we have the ability to store energy. That's what fat is. Fat is stored energy so that when the lean times come, we draw on that energy when We can only eat one meal a day or one meal every other day. Um, We're able to survive. And so the fact that we are we are um, in a world today where most Americans never go more than about nine or ten hours without calorie intake. So we're always storing energy as fat, yet we're never utilizing the fat stores. So that's why periodic fasting, for example, going, you know, going somewhere between 14 and 20 hours. Without any calorie intake, we feed on the fat stores. So we're all good at storing fat as, or storing energy as fat. And yet we, if we don't understand that, we can be frustrated trying to lose weight because it's very, very difficult to do that. So having an evolutionary understanding of our instincts, what's driving us and why, um, is, is absolutely huge. And it's really important for young men, especially not just young men, young women sometimes struggle with this too, but it's way a problem for young men, which is internet gaming addiction and internet porn addiction. And it's, it's just not a surprise when you understand what's driving us and why from the evolutionary brain perspective. So what is the, um, what are some more of the of the evolutionarily adaptive uh, emotions slash instincts that we have that are uh, being being um, that are that are not so adaptive in modern society? Wow, that's a great question. It's a big question. Um, well, if we just think about what was life like, or what do we know life is still like for those remaining uh, cultures that live more or less in a um, in a way that doesn't defile and degrade primary reality. In other words, in a way that honors primary reality, the living world, the biosphere, as primary. Because I, I see that as the fundamental distinction between sustainable and unsustainable cultures. Unsustainable cultures are unaccountable to the future. That is, they live in a way that degrades everything that the future will depend upon. Soil, forest, water, other species, and so forth. Sustainable cultures, there are no, there have never been a sustainable civilization. City-based civilizations are almost by definition. In fact, I think I heard you in an interview <laughs> 10 years ago ago quoting Catton or something that you know almost by definition cities are human ecosystems that have overshot their carrying capacity but um, sustainable cultures live in a way that's small enough where people are accountable to each other and instincts have co-evolved in a way that allows them to then thrive so even such a thing as walking down the city street it's not natural. It's not instinctual. It's, it's somewhat dif- dysfunctional to walk by strangers and not acknowledge them and have them acknowledge us. There's, um, I, I, as part of this post doom conversation series that I'm involved in that I interviewed you a couple weeks ago around, I had a conversation with Steve. Go ahead. I, I had a conversation with Stephen Jenkinson uh, just uh, just a few days ago, and he told the story um, that he said it may be an urban legend, but nonetheless he uses it because it's got a good point. Uh, the story of of somebody from some indigenous culture somewhere was taken um, by this industrial, you know, Westerner uh, into a city, and you know, after sort of acclimating and being able to even, you know, walk, took him into a subway and, uh, 
and this person was terrified. They, they sort of glued themselves against the wall because all these people were walking around and walking so fast. And he said, what are they? You know, and, and what he said to his Western friend was, what are these people afraid of? What are they terror, you know, terrified of? And he said, they're not terrified at all. They're just going to work. And he said, no, people don't move like that if they're not terrified. And his, his point, or at least my interpretation of his point was that we have behaviors now that we have to use in cities, in big city life, to just be able to go through a day. But those behaviors, such as ignoring uh, other human beings uh, on a subway or on a street or whatever, are not native to us. They're not normal. They're not healthy. And we, and at some level, we feel that uh, that dysfunction. Um, and and it, it has everything to do with relationships between men and men, men and women, uh, different age groups. I mean, how in traditional societies the elders were always esteemed and valued, and it's not a surprise because they were the ones passing on the wisdom for how to survive and thrive within the ecosystem. And today our elders don't know that. My my mother and father are clueless about any of that stuff. So we don't revere our elders because they're not passing on this kind of wisdom. And now because of technological rapid change, you know, the only way you can stay on top of things is to be sort of adapted to this fast paced change. Well, as you and I know, that's not going to sustain. I mean, this, this kind of rapid technological, I call it idolatry of, of the technology, um, and idolatry of the market. This is, this can't be sustained. So we're going to exhibit dysfunction at virtually every level of society and also in our own psyches. And so some people are smart. Like you, you move away from the city. You move out to where you've got a bear that can be n- napping on your porch. Um, and you, you have moved, in fact, more than that, you, you have articulated as, as effectively as anybody I know, why human centeredness, anthropocentrism is so destructive and this idea of human supremacy is so, is so toxic, uh, not just toxic to ourselves, but toxic to everything we touch, everything we relate to, because it isn't a relationship. We don't have relationships. So. So I, I have two responses. One of them is, um, that uh oh can you hear me by the way i can yeah okay great um <clears throat> anyway one of them is that whenever i used to go on tour when i would go to a city i would at the end of the day go back to my hotel room and shut the drapes and turn the lights off and then just <laughs> basically stay in bed until i had to do the the next event or i had to to fly out because I felt so abraded yes. from sharp corners and so many people. Uh, so, so, so respond to that and then I'll bring up the other thing. Yeah. Well, I think that's exactly it. I mean, Paul Shepard talked for years, um, who I learned through Dolores LaChapelle. And I apologize. There's, I'm in a library, the Humboldt State University Library. So I can hear people talking in the distance and I, I don't know how to, you know, I, 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 I can't tell them to stop. I'm in a big room. But in any event, we who are have become accustomed to city based life, four square walls, uh, telecommunications, automobiles, transportation, uh, uh, electricity and all of the things that electricity brings some good and lots not good to just be able to survive and thrive in a city. You have to adapt to these things. And yet people who don't live in cities, people who live in a, in a I thou relationship, a personal relationship to the living world in its particulars with its species and that particular skunk who comes out here every day, that particular chipmunk, that particular mama bear, you know, this particular dog, that particular carton or whatever. I mean, these trees having a personal relationship with the living world is the antithesis of what it is to be to survive and thrive in an average day in a city and so the fact that you would want to close off all of that uh when you were forced by circumstances or speaking schedule or whatever to be in these kinds of highly degraded and highly artificial 
environments that are louder than normal, uh, louder than natural, um, sharper than natural, um, uh, not living, uh, often toxic. <laughs> Makes sense to me. I mean, I, I, when I'm, when I'm forced to be in cities, especially larger cities, I have to find a park. I have to find places where they're green. I have to find places where I can see birds or, you know, even chipmunks, whatever, squirrels, anything that's alive and that's not, that's not controlled by humans. Because as Paul Shepard talked about, there's a certain cultural insanity that begins to happen simply by the process of domestication and the process of thinking that we can control ourselves and each other and we live in a highly controlled world and fairly clueless to the psychic toll, the emotional toll that that has on us. Well, that that brings up the second point I was going to raise, which is John Livingston talked about how we normally think of cities as places of sensory overload, and we were just talking about them as sensory overload. But he also pointed out that, um, especially in a city, but even for the rest of us, almost all of our sensory perceptions are either created by or mediated by human beings. And we did not evolve that way, and we – that has a profound – well, what he thinks that does is that puts us in an echo chamber, and when you're in an echo chamber, you go insane – and so he believed that most of our ideologies are, to use his word, hallucinations. Yeah. I, 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 there's nothing I would take issue with that there. Uh, because as, as, as you pointed out, I mean, this, in a city, there's sensory overload, but what are the senses being bombarded by? They're being bombarded by, Radio waves, they're being bombarded by sound waves, they're being bo- bombarded by visual stimulation. But none of it, or very little of it, in the range of what would be considered natural, normal, inevitable, healthy for millions of years of evolution. And so we're not getting the kind of sensory stimuli that we evolved to thrive within, and we are getting all kinds of sensory stimuli, often, you know, we're not getting any natural smells, for example. We're getting artificial chemical smells that do damage. We're not getting any natural visual images of the kind that just touch the soul and and and, and evoke emotional response. We get the sights and smells and sounds and tastes, in some cases, of the kind of certainly processed food that... Um, that do lead to a, let's just say, unhealthiness. They, 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 they don't facilitate wholesome, viable, thriving humanity within an, within a habitat that's healthy. So what, what are the, I know this is a terribly broad question, but what are the effects of this? What, what does that do to us to be smelling diesel fuel as opposed to, um, as opposed to a forest or as opposed to the desert or as opposed to, you know, whatever, a grassland. What, what does that do to us? Not that specific one, but, but all of these together. Well, I, I, any attempt that I would have to put what it does to us into language would itself be um, too small, um, too narrow, um, not deep enough, not rich enough, because language itself, symbolic language itself, limits the, this, the experience. And so I honestly don't know, but uh, in terms of what I could put in words, but certainly agitatedness, unease, a lack of feeling at home, a lack of feeling deep peace, certainly a lack of feeling related to anything more than the human, you know, that we, we, our environments, you know, if our environments co-create us, like if who we show up to be psychically, physically, and every other way, um, is largely called forth by what we call the environment, then a human only or human made or, 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 uh, um, a human constructed artificial environment calls forth artificial constructed aspects of our psychic, emotional, relational being. And so it's not a surprise. I don't know the actual figures, but the amount of, of uh, chemicals that Americans put into them in order to try to s- have some semblance of sanity and emotional groundedness, um, it, it's large. 
uh, and the ways that we distract ourselves um, through shopping. I mean, think about it. 10,000 years ago, what was there to be addicted to? You know, were, you know, were you going to find some fermented berries? You know, there was nothing that we could genuinely be what we today would call addicted to. Yet today, we are surrounded with you know, drugs, alcohol, tobacco, caffeine, video games, shopping, internet porn, romance novels, social networking sites, and on and on and on that our brains didn't evolve to know how to deal with. And so these are what Deirdre Barrett calls super normal stimuli. That is, they're things that we would normally be allured to, normally be attracted to, yet they're in concentrations or dosages or intensities that we have no defenses against. And so it's not a surprise that we see the kind of rampant addiction among all kinds of things. Even news, news becomes addictive. Sports becomes addictive. I mean, it's... And so they play on our instincts. They, 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 it's almost like they hook these deep drives that were, were evolutionary programmed to pay attention to this or pay attention to that or eat this kind of food or do this kind of thing. And yet we are, it's like being pulled around with the nose ring. And um, to come back to your question, the, the consequences, the cost on us individually and especially the costs on us collectively, we don't find healthy communities they're very rare. I mean, they exist on the fringes, but, and part of that is because monetary societies, market societies always destroy community. They always destroy the living world. There's no counterexamples in human history. I'm thinking about something that my friend Jeanette Armstrong, she's an Okanagan Indian writer and activist. She once said to me that, you know, we Indians have the same problems that you white people do in terms of getting along. That mm-hmm. we, you know, we have spats, we, 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 we disagree with each other, but mm-hmm. the big difference is that, um, we live in place and I recognize that my great grandchildren might marry your great grandchildren, so we have to develop social ways to get along. And I'm, I'm thinking about how much difference that makes in all of your behavior if you're planning on being in place for the next 500 years. I completely agree. Uh, our placelessness, our mobility, which has only been facilitated by fossil fuels. I mean, prior to the fossil fuel era, you didn't find, you, you, you know, surely there were wealthy people that could afford to, you know, take a trip around the world or whatever. But for 99% of the population, where you lived was where your grandparents lived, where your grandchildren would live. And yes, that sense of obligation, that sense of responsibility to the land. Plus, there was when you live in place, when you live related to place and to the beings of place. One of the things I always appreciated about your stuff is you speak of the people. You you know the. It's like I I'm 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 amazed at how Western anthropology took us down a dead end path. By speaking of, well, first of all, the anthropocentric way that we speak of virtually everything, but in terms of speaking of, of others as its rather than thou's, rather than you's, rather than people. And, you know, the idea that indigenous people believed in various spirits misses the point. Tribal indigenous people who lived in right relationship to the land related personally to the trees. They related personally to the other creatures. They related personally to the soil which sustained them. They related personally to the sky. And having a personal relationship to all of the various aspects of primary reality turns out is the only sustainable way to live. The, the, the quote about living in place for 500 years, it's like, yes. I, I remember um, Jim, Jim Dodge, uh, a bioregionalist, had a quote that I used to mention in my programs a lot quite a few years ago. He said, you know, uh, this is just a sort of a paraphrase. It's not word for word, I'm sure. But he said, most of the people I talk to believe that we have a fighting chance. Now, this, of course, was before <laughs> the parenthetical note. This is before an understanding of climate change and abrupt climate change. But he, he said this in the late 80s, I believe it was. He said, most of the people I talk to believe that we have a fighting chance to stop environmental destruction in 30 or 40 years and to turn the culture around in 800 to 1,000 years. He said, fighting chance translates as long odds, but good company. 
So we might as well just start with the best style and spirit that we can muster, knowing that there's only a functional difference between the root and the flower. They're both a, bar, a part of the same abiding faith. So dig in. You know, that longer term place based perspective. This is now me speaking. That longer term place based perspective is, um, is indeed what helps us deal with conflicts. It, it is indeed what recognizes that, that, uh, we have to measure well-being and success not in human-centered terms like GNP or GDP or any other human-centered metric, but we, the only sane measure of progress and well-being is how well is, is the soil doing decade by decade? How well are the forests doing decade by decade? How well are the other creatures doing decade by decade? Life-centered, ecocentric measures of progress and well-being. If there were, if there were a trim tab, the only, the, the, the one change that's most important is that we need to, to use religious language, repent of human-centered metrics of progress and well-being and come home to life-centered, uh, ecocentric measures of, of progress and well-being. Everything else is suicidal, it seems to me. I don't understand why not everyone understands that. Because it seems clear to me that the um, that that without a living planet, you don't have any society whatsoever. Which means that the planet has to be primary and the society has to be secondary. I don't understand how there is a single person on the planet who doesn't understand that. Well, I can, <laughs> I can, uh, uh, I, I say this with humility. I can enlighten you on that one because I was a part of a population in America. Forty percent of Americans consider themselves evangelicals, and and uh, Bible, the Bible is their primary authority. God for them is a supernatural being. Uh, their vision of the future is that <laughs> we got a few decades, maybe you know, Jesus is coming back. It's this magical, otherworldly, supernatural worldview. And so they don't see Gaia or the living world or the ecosphere as divine. They don't see. We, we have been stuck with a toxic religious orientation that's been book-based um, and and ecologically clueless for so long. And it's not just Christianity. I mean, virtually all of the major faiths of the last 2,500 years, what, what are called the axial religions, have a very transcendent, otherworldly notion of uh, of spirituality or whatever and it tends to be very uh negligent at best and degrading more likely of primary reality what is genuinely primary reality which is soil forest water life so uh, t- two things one is that um i heard a christian comedian several years ago um saying that uh so god comes back you know, and then this is a standard Christian God, so we'll just right. accept that for the, okay, the conceit okay. of the joke. Right. So the, 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 the God comes back and he, he looks at humans and says, I put you here and it was a nice place and I turned my back for like 2000 years and what have you done? <laughs> and so, you know, even in that perspective, from a, even from a Christian perspective, we can still have God go, holy crap, what did you yeah. do? Like, what the fuck? Yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, there are, okay, I, I need to, I, I don't want to overstate the case. There are profoundly ecologically sensitive, green-hearted Christians, no question. But the vast majority of Christianity um, has been ecologically clueless, and part of that is because the theology has foisted that. Oh, I don't disagree with you at all. Um, the, the, next, the next part of this is, but how did all of these reality hating religions develop my quick theory is that i think they developed as a response to trauma um which we can either explore or not explore anyway so what how did they develop certainly why did part, they develop yeah part of it is trauma i'm quite sure i think you're right on that Another huge part of it is what uh, one of the most influential books I've read in the last, say, seven to ten years is a book called The Green History of Religion. And it interprets the religion of the last twenty five hundred years, the axial age religions, from the perspective of environmental history. Like what's been happening for the last twelve thousand years in terms of primary reality, the, what we call the environment. I love the fact that Thomas Berry used to say that the environment is not our surroundings. 
It's our source, sustenance, and end. And, and yet if we call primary reality, which should properly be called Gaia or God, I mean, I, I in my programs, I spell God, G-O-D-D-E, partly because that's the old English spelling. It's also gender neutral. But what, what those of us who spell the word God, G-O-D-D-E, what we're meaning by that word, by that term God, is not a, a supernatural person, not not a person outside reality, but a personification of reality. And so what the axial faiths did was that they emerged. This is one of the reasons why I love Teddy Goldsmith, Edward Goldsmith, his book, The Way, An Ecological Worldview. He's done, he was the editor and the uh, publisher of the Ecologist magazine for almost 40 years. And um, he's done more to further the difference and an understanding of the difference between sustainable cultures and unsustainable cultures. Um, and he talked about that in, in healthy, stable, sustainable cultures, um, there lacks the trauma that you just spoke about. They, they lack this profound intimacy with time, this continuity with the past, that you honored the ancestors by honoring their wisdom of how to live ecologically, and an honoring of the future as ultimately your judge and compassionate guide. So there was the inviting of future generations, obviously in your imagination, to be the, to be the judge of how you live in the present. So this idea of acting in the present with the seventh generation in mind isn't just a good idea. To do otherwise is evil because that's the fundamental role of religion or life ways, not just religion, but life ways. The fundamental role was to ensure that the future was never compromised by the present. In other words, to ensure accountability to the future. So that's why Teddy Goldsmith defined religion in healthy cultures as the control mechanism of stable, sustainable societies, meaning that element of society that, that insists that limits are honored as sacred. In unsustainable cultures, and all of the great axial faiths of the last 2,500 years emerged in cultures that were already profoundly unsustainable, so they couldn't in any realistic way, be the control mechanism and ensure that the political and economic order lived ecologically. So they were degraded to being not the cope, not the, the control mechanism, but the coping mechanism or a coping mechanism. So religion in unsustainable cultures becomes a control mechanism of help. I mean, I mean, I'm sorry. Religion in, in, in unsustainable cultures becomes the coping mechanism, that which helps people live a good life and have good relationships and die a peaceful death and leave a sweet legacy, but in the midst of dysfunctional and unsustainable cultures. And so I think you're right. Trauma is definitely part of it. But when you look at what the climate was doing for the last six or 7,000 years and how it was forcing, it was drying up certain regions and, and forcing people to come together. And once you get the kind of, um, the you know the Iron Age, uh, and you start seeing these this arms race of weapons, where any peaceful culture, any egalitarian culture, any culture that was ecologically wise would be overtaken by others. You know that whole parable of the tribes thing. You've, you've got a situation where it became so unsustainable and so perhaps inevitable. I mean, it's possible that we the world we're living in now was an inevitable result of the last six or seven thousand years of anthropocentrism. But I think you're absolutely right. Trauma and um, and uh, 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 a, a sense of despair almost. I mean, you put a you put a wild cat and uh, a, ti- a tiger or a lion in a cage, and it exhibits all kinds of mental and behavioral dysfunction. Well, we who have been living in these dysfunctional cities for so long exhibit some of that same psychic uh, or psychotic um, behavior, and consequently, it also exhibits in our relationships. So, a phrase that keeps coming to mind as you've been talking this this whole time is toxic mimic. Um, where that was a phrase I got from somewhere where the, it means it takes the form of something and perverts the content. And so we have all of these, like, like our need for sugar or salt or fat is, is there, but, um, and, and is there for a reason, but that, instinct gets turned into sort of the toxic mimic and an addiction to potato chips. Um, you know, I think, you, yeah, I, I think, I think you're onto something really. I mean, I love the language toxic mimicry because that's really what it is. I mean, I, you know, uh, 
for I used to in my evening programs when I did on evolutionary psychology and brain science and testosterone and all that kind of stuff. One of the images that I had, I had three images that uh, I mentioned that somebody had sent me um, in an email. And the first image uh, it shows this male adolescent moose that's walking up to and sniffing the behind of a statue of a buffalo. Um, and then the second image shows the the moose getting behind it, and the third image shows the the moose. Ma- Counting the statue of the buffalo and you know and of course audiences laugh um but i one of the things i say especially when i've spoken in college and universities i said settings i say all right now before you guys you know laugh too hard at least this buffalo is three-dimensional just saying you know <laughs> and but it is it's a toxic mimicry i mean that's what Porn is is toxic mimicry. That's what the kinds of high concentrated uh, um, processed foods are. They're toxic mimicry. I mean, even alcohol. I mean, we haven't had hard alcohol, you know, the 60, 70, 80 proof, um, more than 400 years. And so, you know, you had wine and beers for much longer, but they didn't have the kind of highly concentrated toxicity that is so rampant and, and so uh, almost unavoidable today. That's why I... I, I limit my exposure to what's gets, what gets called news because frankly, I don't want just a small handful of corporations to be feeding my mind and feeding my emotions on what I think about and feel on a day by day basis. So I pretty much avoid, uh, news of all sort. Once a week, I typically check, check just to see what other people are talking about. I don't want there to be a major world war or assassination that I don't know about, but, um, even watching the news can become, it's a form of, of, of toxic mimicry because we're programmed to pay attention to things that could matter and that where we could make a difference. And yet most news that most people expose them to, we can't make any difference whatsoever. You know, I find it really interesting that one of my favorite activists in the world is Gail Dines, who's a, who's a great anti-porn activist. And some people say to her, Oh gosh, why are you so against sex? And she says, you know, because I'm against pornography, Saying I'm against sex, that's like saying that because somebody's against McDonald's, they're against food. And, <laughs> exactly. And so what I love, well, the reason I bring her up right now is because you and she are coming from entirely different directions and coming to the same conclusion of the, um, you know, the toxicity of, you're both, you both end up comparing pornography to, to these toxic foods. Right. I mean, we're, we, we are, we are evolutionally programmed to have healthy relationships. And the thing is, I mean, the, the, now I'm 60 years old, so I didn't have the kinds of temptations that young men today. And, and again, I'm not meaning just men. There are definitely women who have struggled with internet gaming and internet porn. And there are some women that have more testosterone than many guys. I mean, hell, my, my daughter is one of those. My, my oldest daughter was the second woman in U.S. history to be on the all Marine, that is United States Marine Corps wrestling team. So, you know, I know uh, about women that have high t- levels of testosterone. But I also know that we are programmed to be, have healthy relationships. And internet porn, for example, is ruining an entire generation of young men who don't know how to relate to women. They don't know how to relate to human beings. They don't know about touch and oxytocin and caress and love and care and gentleness because they think it's all about gentle, gentle stuff. And it's my, 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 uh, a woman who dated my son actually for Five years who I still relate to like a daughter-in-law. She said when she became sexually active at the age of 18, she said the boys were trying to do to me, and that's the way she framed it, what they were learning on internet porn because that was their sex education. And she said it was painful. So she said I had to get drunk or go down that path to just have, have, have sex to find it enjoyable. And she said I realized this was dead end. So she said I started dating guys twice my age, those in their 30s and young 40s, because she said those were the only ones I could find that weren't addicted to internet porn. So we have about five minutes left, and um, I, I agree with you with, with what you said about how uh, once 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 this this, this these cultures um, took this 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 negative turn that they had uh, um, 
competitive advantage. If you destroy yes. your land base and convert the land base into weapons of war, Correct. you have a competitive advantage over your neighbors who who did not. Correct. And so there's a sense in which I don't think that humanity made this end inevitable, but I think that this culture made this end inevitable. So given that, and given that we both care desperately for the state of the soil and the state of the forests, yes. what do what do what do we do? What do you want listeners of this program? First, what do you want them to do internally? And what do you want them to realize? And then second, what do you want them to do in the real world? Yeah, well, big question and, and uh, big questions. And I'd be arrogant to be too prescriptive. But what I would say is that um, what religious people mean by faith in God, I just interpreted secular like trusting reality. And so to whatever degree you can nurture trust, anyone listening to this conversation, to whatever degree you can nurture trust in time, trust in reality, uh, trust in reality as it is, not as you wish it was. Um, and then find where your joy, your passion, your juice intersects with what your community's needs are, with what the species in your, in your little piece of land. I mean, it's, it's again shifting from this idea that the land belongs to us and coming back to the only thing that's, that's sustainable, which is that we belong to the land. Well, each of us can have that attitude toward the, the plot of land that we're living on or renting or whatever. Um, so wherever your passion, your juice your joy intersects with what's needed in your community the the needs of this of the the well-being of the of the, the stream that you live near or the river that you live near or the species that are there it may not make a difference this is the thing we're living we're now living in a very very difficult time where there are surely systems that are already out of our control and we could be in an ad- abrupt climate regime that could spin out so so horrifically that there may not even be humans 50 years from now. But nonetheless, anybody can take seeds of plants that they love and move them a little bit further north. That assisting of the migration of plants, because they don't have, trees do not have legs. So unless we assist trees in migrating to cooler climes, Thousands of species of trees are going to go extinct in the next 50, 70 years. And so, so how do we assist life in, uh, and, and, you know, building topsoil and planting trees are, are just some of the most important holy work that needs to be done. And so anything that you can do to fall more deeply in love with life, to find out what life needs in your region, and then, um, attend to that, I think that's going to be holy work. Well, thank you so much for saying all that, and thank you for your work in the world. And I would like to thank listeners for listening. My guest today has been Michael Dowd. This is Derek Jensen for Resistance Radio on the Progressive Radio Network.